Ah, beautiful day the Lord has made. You know, uh, he's a good God, ain't he? How many come in here expecting God to move tonight? Amen? Amen. I'm looking forward to it, ain't you? Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to do some praise and worship. We're going to praise God a little bit and uh, a, a couple things and let some of the choir get in up here and, and uh, just have a good time in the Lord. Amen. Praise God. I got one little thing I need to do, a little project here I got to do uh, before we get started. We're going to pray and everything. Well, let, let, yeah, let's pray. Let's pray first, and then we'll do the little project, okay? Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And you know, got one answer prayer. Tracer come home from the hospital a while ago, what Ronnie said. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and here in just a minute. And uh, then I got a little special thing I want to do, and then we'll just be led by there. Amen. Praise God. Come on in here, Sly. <laughs> Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Good to see everybody this evening. Choir looks good up there. Let me see that smile. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Amen. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. How about that? Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we worship you. We come in this house tonight, God, to praise you and worship you and to lift you up, God. Lord, you said where two or three are gathered, there I'm also, God. And, Lord, we just love you. We invite the Internet in here this uh, evening. We thank you so much for being with us tonight. We pray that God's going to touch you right where you're at, even all over the world. We just love you, too. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ loves you so much, too. And uh, we're just praying tonight, God. We thank you for the prayers this morning and the, and the power of God moving this morning, God. And we're looking forward to uh, Holy Ghost have your way in this service tonight. Just move uh, in a mighty way. And we thank you, Lord, for touching all of those folks that we prayed for this morning. And uh, the folks tonight, God, we just love you and we praise you, God. We worship, we pray for Sister Cheryl. You'll touch her right where she's at, God. We lift her up to you, God, in Jesus' name. Pray for Sue's uh, uh, sister. I pray, God, you'll have mercy on her and wake her out of the coma, God, in Jesus' name. We pray for Jean's sister, God. We lift her up to you, God, in Jesus' name, Lord. We praise you tonight and we worship you. We pray for the praise and worship that it will glorify you tonight, God. Lord, we pray for my brother Nathan as he ministers the word tonight. I, uh, I just lift him up to you tonight, God, to uh, just let him speak the words you'd have us hear tonight, God. And, Lord, we love you and we praise you tonight, God. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to ask uh, Mississippi, would you come here just real quick? <coughs> and we certainly pray to everybody, appreciate everybody that, that uh, did the work yesterday. A lot of work went on here yesterday. Last night I had a dream of Jesus coming out and we already died. And he showed us our mansion and the fruit tree. And I seen the people that died, the people that we do and don't know. And I had that dream over and over. And I, in the middle of the night, I said, thank you for this dream. God's good, ain't he? <laughs> Praise God, I couldn't make it without my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. None of us could. Can't even walk, amen, praise God. Brother Few, and uh, 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 hold on just a minute before you get started here. We got that uh, September the 28th thing going on, and we got it set up after on a sign, and it says, the singing hot dogs, is that what it is, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought it was the chosen few they are talking about there, but Richard said it was my group, so y'all figure that one out, praise God. We're going to have a good time, I tell you right now, September 28th. Y'all be praying about it, amen. Brother Richard. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't claim to know anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. I'm not Paul. I mean it's like for the blood tonight, amen. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that saved me. One day when I was lost, he died upon that cross, and I know it was his blood that saved me. Yes, I know it was his blood. Yes, I know it was his blood. I know it was his blood. 
One day when I was lost, he died upon that cross. And I know it was his blood that saved me. Let's 
somebody touch me Glory, glory, glory Somebody touch me Glory, glory, glory Somebody touch me Must have been the hand of my Lord Well, in a while I was singing Somebody touch me while I was singing Somebody touch me been a while I was seeing it. Somebody touch me must have been the hand of my Lord. Well, I know, I know, I know it was the hand of my Lord. Well, I know, I know, I know it was the hand of my Lord. I know, I know, I know it was the hand of my Lord. No, it was a hand of my Lord. Yes, while I was shouting, somebody touched me. While I was shouting, somebody touched me. While I was shouting, somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of my Lord. Here I am Take me in 
Bagel cold, touch my lips, here I am. Here I am. Take me 
my lips and here I am Hey, go cold, touch my lips Praise God. Hallelujah. Take me into the Holy Ghost. Give me some ushers, please. Brother Dwayne. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Well, it's going to be real slow, Hope. That's okay. You know, I, I got a new song here I've been working on, and uh, I'm still working on it. Y'all bear with me. Praise God. He's a mighty God, isn't he? You know, one day I was sitting at the house and uh, kind of picking on a guitar, and the Lord gave me these words, and because uh, I was talking to Him. Tell me why, Lord, you save a wretch like me. Tell me why, Lord. You'd save a man like me. Tell me why, Lord, you do this thing for me. Tell me why, Lord, you'd save a man like me. Cause I know in my heart that you saved me and I know 
in my heart now I'm free tell me why oh Lord tell me why oh Lord you would do this thing for me tell me why Lord you give me the peace and joy tell me why Lord you give me mercy and grace tell me why Lord you love me like you do tell me why Lord cause I owe it all to you cause I know in my heart that you saved me and I know in my heart now I'm free tell me why oh Lord tell me why oh Lord you would do this thing for me tell me why Lord you give me such peace and joy tell me why Lord you give me the victory tell me why Lord you do this thing for me tell me why Lord you save a man like me cause I know in my heart that you save me and I know in my heart that I'm free tell me why oh Lord tell me why oh Lord you would say a man like me tell me why oh Lord tell me why oh Lord that you love me like do. Praise the Lord. Amen. I give God the praise. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Brother Nathan, Brother Bland. Praise God. That was pretty good for the first time. That was pretty good if it was the 10th, wasn't it? Praise God. And you know, it's such a, a privilege to be able to teach His Word. Amen? It's a privilege to hear His Word, isn't it? Aren't you glad that, I mean, we have so much in that book. Can you imagine if we had to just take a few things that were on a wall, try to fill in the blanks, seek signs? I mean, we've got a book with everything. Is that not just the love of God? It's wonderful. <clears throat> uh, we're going to get back onto one of our topics that um, I think we've gotten four parts done on. How many enjoyed the series on prayer? How many's implemented some of it? Praise God. You know, even teaching on it has you know, uh, just kind of re reawakened some of those things, those practices for me and really got me deeper into prayer this past week. Uh, anytime I teach something, it's I'm God's teaching me. It's uh, a lot of times I'm so up here saying "ouch," Amen. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be on the significance of purpose, and this is part five. And if if I gave this a subtitle, it would be the Kingdom Key to Purpose. Anybody know what the Kingdom Key to Purpose is already? I know you know it. You're just not telling me. <clears throat> Maybe you don't. But you will, right after we 
get through a few slides here. Um, <clears throat> I got a lot to move through, and I've got just a little bit of time to move through it, so try to take notes as quick as you can. Remember, if you listen to something, you remember about 40% of it. If you write it down, you remember about 65% of it. If you listen to it seven times, you remember about 96%. So anytime I hear something good, I listen to it about 10 times because I want to get it about 99.9, amen? In the beginning, God had a goal. Do you believe that? He has a purpose to things, right? Man was given dominion. Oh, I know what's off. Let me open up with prayer real quick. Father God, We just praise you. We thank you for the service this morning, for the praise and worship, for the message. God, we thank you for the praise and worship this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, God, for the blessings that are in our life. God, we thank you for life. Lord, even if right now we are in a time that we feel like we're not being blessed, that we're in a trying time. God, we thank you even for the trying times because we know that it worketh patience and we know that we are growing in those times. And we have shown ourselves ready to move to that next level, to go deeper in you. And so trying times come. God, if we didn't want to be so close to you, then we wouldn't have as many trying times as we do sometimes. But God, we know that we're safe in you. Lord, while we're here on this earth, we have a purpose. And I pray, God, that you would reveal your purpose for our life to us. I pray, God, that something that is spoke tonight would resonate in our hearts and would change us for the better. I pray that you would not let one word fall from my mouth that the Holy Ghost has not given. In Jesus' name we pray, and we say, Spirit, come. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So God, in the beginning, he had a goal. God still has a goal. And guess what? God's goal has not changed. Isaiah 14, 24 says, The Lord of hosts have sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Amen. In the beginning, we know from Genesis 1.26 that man was given dominion, right? Given rulership, given authority. God owns the earth, but he put man into a position to manage it under his headship. That's why anything, uh, including our vehicles that we drive, the house we live in, the, the businesses that we run, all of it is his property, And we manage it because it's God's property and we are his stewards. And we want to make sure that we take care of anything God's given us. Amen. That's why we even take care of our bodies. Because even the body is the temple of the Lord's. Amen. So man was given dominion in the the beginning. Now God is really smart. Did y'all know that? That was an easy one. He knew if he gave us a will and he gave us authority that there was a slight chance that we could mess something up. Surely. (laughs) And guess what? We did. Did we not? Mankind messed up through Adam. Amen. And, but God is so smart that he said, if something happens, I have got to make sure there's a plan in place. So that I can restore them. Because I'm going to get done what I want to get done. I'm going to have done what I have purposed. It's going to happen. And so, before the foundation of the earth, Jesus was slain. It didn't happen 2,000 years ago. It happened before the foundation of the earth. Because in God's eyes, it was already done. Amen? Remember, he never starts something until he finishes it. Isn't he smart? So, 1424, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. 
And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. I think I have the NIV. Yep, the Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be. If somebody told you, I've planned this this way, and it will be this way, do you think they're going to go off that plan even just a little bit? No. God is resolute, is he not? And as I have purposed, so it will stand. So he put in place a way for us to be restored in case things got out of whack. Amen? And guess what? Things did get out of whack. So we have to ask ourselves, what does he want to restore? I got a few things that I was writing down. I've been working on this message this week, and I tell you, God has just really, really shown me some stuff. I mean, I just, I kind of found myself, I'd be studying, and all of a sudden something would hit me, and I would just start crying, and I'd get down on the floor, and even today, I was typing some stuff up, putting all this in order, all my notes in order, and I just got to crying and walking through the house. I mean, I hope that you guys just, I hope that he just reveals to you the way he did to me this thing because it it is so powerful. And I know that because I know that it ain't me that's, I I don't put speeches together. It's God that speaks, amen? And if it's him, then it's good. What does he want to restore? I want you to write this down. First, he wants to restore us back to him. Amen. Second, and I may get on this right here by itself a little bit more in the future. He wants to restore man back to his image. That's so important. Third, and one of the most important, he wants to restore man back to his dominion. Back to his area of dominion. Back to his assignment. I've told you all many times when I was born, I felt like the whole purpose to life was to be born, to get saved, and to leave. (laughs) But you were born in order to fulfill an assignment. You can't start on your assignment until you have been reconciled, restored back to God. Amen? And then that is when things are just getting started because you have an assignment. Isn't that wonderful? My grandmother, I tell you, I mean, I was, I I know that she was in her 60s and I was probably driving her up a wall and she was thinking, I wish Jesus would come back. (laughs) I was probably part of the reason. And I would, you know, and I got saved and I was thinking, yeah. But I was young and I thought, man, I, I feel like I have so much in me. And I realize now, and I'm able, because Tyler will talk about it. I've told him about, you know, the horses and we, we talk about those that have went on. We talk about them up there, what they're probably doing right now. And uh, sometimes we'll be riding down the road and I'll say, I'll think of somebody that's up there. And I'll say, I wonder what they're doing right now. Because they're living right now in the land of the living. Amen. They're there right now and they're alive. They have not been asleep since the day they left this world. Isn't that amazing? And I think, and I'll, and I'll, I'll discuss those things with him and he'll say, I'll say, you know, isn't that going to be wonderful to see that actually happen? You know, that, the rapture. And he'll say, yeah, but I, I, I'm kind of having fun. And I'll tell him, I'll say, son, you know, that's fine. You have so much in you. You're not finished here yet. There's something that you have to do for God. And I said, it's fun to live here. There's things that you do. You're in the world. You're not of the world. And you have an assignment. You can't leave until you fulfill your assignment. And so it gives him joy that, man, I am here. I've been deployed. I've got something I'm supposed to do. And that is a wonderful thing to realize. Amen. I do this all the time, but everybody, take a breath. If you breathe then, you have an assignment and you're not finished. Amen? As long as I wake up in the morning and I breathe breathe oxygen into this body, I'll say, all right, Lord, 
what am I supposed to do? He don't give you something for nothing, amen? Isn't that wonderful? Salvation actually comes from the word salvage. A lot of times when we think salvage, we think of junk. But see, you were made, Adam was made, and he was perfect. But he messed up, so God had to create a plan in order to salvage him. So that he could fulfill what it is that he's supposed to do. His purpose. He's got something important that he's supposed to do. And so I I am so thankful for that plan because otherwise we'd still be junk. But he saved the remnant, amen? He kept us. Ephesians 2.10. I'm going to read King James and NIV on this. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The NIV says, for we are God's handiwork. Look at your neighbor and say, a handyman made me. A good one. A very good one. For we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus, to do what? Good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you know what I love about that? He didn't just make me, he didn't just make you and then say, all right, what am I going to do with this thing? He already had a plan for you and then he created you. To fulfill an assignment. I'm going to get real teachy tonight. So I'm going to make sure y'all get this. If if you're thinking, not me, that must be so and so. No, you too. God doesn't do anything by mistake. I don't care if you were born and you weren't planned by your parents. God had a plan. I heard a man on the radio the other day, he said that him and his wife, he said he was um, sitting at a table, him and his wife of a friend's house, and he had to have, they went to have dinner with him, and they had a one-year-old, and he sat right beside the one-year-old, and he said, that was the most disgusting dinner I've ever ate. He said, because the baby was talking to his peas and smushing them, and then the baby didn't like how they looked, and then he would stick them in his ear so he didn't have to look at them, and so but he was, he said the baby done stuff like five peas in his ear and he's having to look over and look at all those peas in his ears. He said he wasn't very hungry. And when they left, he told his wife, he said, I do not want to have kids. And she said, me either. And they actually had a doctor's visit not long after that. And the doctor told them that it was impossible for them to have kids. And now they have two. And they said they love them to death. It doesn't matter if you were planned. It doesn't matter the circumstances of how you came into this earth. If you are here, God had an assignment and he created you to fulfill an assignment. He didn't make you and then say, let me give you something to do. He had something that needed to be done and he said, let me create somebody to do it. So you have a purpose. <clears throat> Matthew five sixteen. Let me let me get this one more time. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the question is, what good works were you designed to do? Because if you do a good work and it's not the correct work, you're doing something wrong. I want to do the right things, amen. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. What happens when they see your good works? And they glorify your Father which is in heaven. Your gift, the works that God has created you to do, they are for the glory of God. If you ever do a good thing and you do good stuff and then you begin to try to take credit for it, you're going to be in trouble. 
Because God is supposed to get all the glory. People are supposed to come to you because of the gift that you have. They are literally, I, I wish I had got the scripture right before this, because it says that a city on a hill cannot be hid. When you are fulfilling your work, God will put you out there and men will not be able to ignore you because of the gift that's inside of you. He does that for his glory. So that people get so excited. Have you ever seen somebody operating in their gift? And you think, man, they are good. I listen to Carrie Job or Eddie James sing and I think, man, they are so good. I mean, I just, hope knows I've got certain people that I love to hear sing. And I mean, anytime Carrie Job comes out with something, I, I, I'm like, oh, we got to get that. Because as soon as I hear it, I, I don't even know what the song's about but as soon as she starts singing I'm just like oh God I mean it just touches me amen why why it's because they have a gift God gave them a gift they recognize their gift and you know what it does for me it excites me because I think man this person is operating there in their gift and look how many people they're impacting. I want to know what my gift is so that I can fulfill what it is that God designed for me to do. Because when you fulfill what God designed for you to do, you will be truly happy. If you try to operate in somebody else's gift, if you try to do something that you were not assigned to do, you will be frustrated. You will be tired. And you will not be at peace. Here's where we're going to get a lot of our scripture from tonight. And I'm going to show you some stuff in these verses that you may have not seen in here before. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. No. We speak of God's secret wisdom. A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Do y'all have some time tonight for me to get through this? <clears throat> no, we speak of God's secret wisdom. A wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began began a couple things I want you to take from this and I want you to verify it with me as I say it verify it with uh, the scripture God has some wisdom that is secret is that what that says hmm we speak of God's secret wisdom you know what that does I'm thinking what is it I want to know. When you have a close friend, guess what? You know things about them that other people don't. Me and Hope, she's my wife, I'm her husband, but we're also best friends. I know things about her that nobody else knows. She knows things about me that nobody else knows. You may see her come in and she has that high-pitched voice sometimes. Hi. And you think, she, you, might, you, you might think, wow, she is so sweet. But in the morning, if she rolls over to me in bed and she says, hey, like that, I'm going to have to cover my face with a pillow. <laughs> we know each other. We see the beautiful parts of each other and we see the ugly parts of each other. We see each other when we would, if anybody else come to the door, we'd say, don't open the door. I'm a mess. It's because we're close. I can tell her anything. I know God knows me, but I want to know him so well that he tells me things. He reveals things to me. I want to have such a deep relationship with him, Steve. And know him. I mean, 
He died for me. I owe him that much, don't I? God has some wisdom that is secret. God has some wisdom that he hides. Is that true? It's been hidden. Lord Jesus, man, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. God has some secret information that is about you. We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. That's you. It was hidden in him before the world began. Mm. He had some wisdom hidden in him before you existed, before the world began. He already had some secret wisdom that he has hidden about you. Have you ever read that and thought about this? I tell you, some of my best studying is when I sit down just to analyze a verse and write it different ways because, I mean, stuff will just start coming out of it. I'll sit down not to study, but just to, just to break down a, a scripture. And before I know it, I've got all my books out. Last one. God has some information about us, and he keeps it a secret. I hope you write those down. Let's look at verse 8. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Write this down. The authorities of this age and culture cannot give you answers to why you exist. None of the rulers of this age, that means people with authority, people who have power, people who have a dominion in some area of of science or education or study, None of them understood it. If they had only known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified him. If people only knew who you were, they wouldn't talk bad about you. You know what that does for me? I'm convinced I don't know any of you. I only know where you are right now. Do you know what that does for me? That keeps me from ever judging somebody. Because if I judge them, I judge them based on right now, which is a moment in time. Not who they're going to be. You have to be careful. Because God sees them as their complete work, who they are going to be. That makes me keep my mouth shut. So sometimes if somebody gets on my nerves, I just say, Lord, I know they're in your image. Help them. (laughs) And when I do something stupid, I say, Lord, I'm your image. You're going to have to deal with me, but help me. I pray that y'all have mercy on me sometimes. Lord Jesus, man, I'm just feeling the presence of God. I don't know if it's that song Richard sang. Every time we sing, take me in. I just, it is such a wonderful song. God is the only one who knows who you are. You may have taken, anybody in here taken an IQ test? 
Anybody want to tell us what your number is? No, I'm just kidding. Did you say 200? <laughs> we got a genius. <laughs> Do you know what I don't like about IQ tests? They judge you based on where you are at a moment in time. You may have went in there. You could have had a thousand things on your mind. You could have been already having a bad day, stressed out, and you take a test, and then they take that number and they judge you for the rest of your life because of the condition you were in at that very moment. Even in school, you may have done good at first, but then there may have been just a small streak where you were below average. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing D's or maybe an F. And you just think, that's just me. And then you begin to believe what people tell you that you are. And so for them on out, you just say, well, I was just a C student. When you do that, do you realize that you have let them label you of who you are from then on? You may have taken an SAT and you had an SAT score. And you let that determine who you are from then on. Now we have, I had to take one of these when I, when I got employment at my per, current place. I had to take a personality test. That was part of me being hired. And I thought, well, I hope I'm in a good mood today. And most time you're looking at those things and you're saying, well, here's what they, they want me to be. Here's what I know I, I am. And so you have these personality tests and then they say, we don't know if we should hire this person because they have this type of personality. Maybe they were just having a bad day. We have so many Things that man has set up. And I'm not saying there's not a use to those things. Those things serve a purpose. But when we believe that that is who we are, it can prevent us from becoming who we really are. This right here says that no one knows who you really are but God. Because he has some secret wisdom that he has hidden that is destined for your glory. And he hid it, he knew it, and he hid it before the world began. And the rulers of this age, that means psychologists, philosophers, scholars, any kind of test, anything where man tries to measure another man, it says they don't understand it. If they really understood God's measurement, what God has called somebody to be, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And you know what they would do? They would culture a person and help a person to grow to their full potential and not judge them and say they're nothing. We know sometimes people may not live to the standard that they should be living to. And we know that we cannot force somebody to be who they're supposed to be. All that we can do is encourage them. Sometimes they're not really, sometimes they're not ready to make a decision to do what they're supposed to. Sometimes we see them financially being irresponsible and they don't want to listen. You can't force them. But we shouldn't throw them away. You just have to realize they're going to have to bump their head a couple of times and get hurt. Tyler will fall and hope she runs around. <gasps> you know, she'll run up and pick him up. I'll say it's good for him. He needs some noggin, some, some knots on his head to realize I shouldn't do that. Sometimes when you get hurt, that's the, the best lesson. And I pick at her because she'll be doing something for, for him, something that I know he can do. Because if I'm at home, he'll go in there and he'll make a sandwich. I want him to be independent. If she's home... She'll, he'll say, I'm hungry, and she'll go right to making a sandwich. And I'll say, well, are you going to chew it up and spit it in his mouth? I 
I say, oh, it's all right. We've got another one on the way. <clears throat> when Adam sinned, God withdrew his Holy Spirit and Adam became an unclean vessel. Adam knew in the beginning what he was supposed to do. He knew what he was designed to do. He, God told him his assignment. Replenish the earth. Uh, cultivate the earth. He knew what he was supposed to do. That was his good works. But Adam violated God's law. He rebelled against God. He declared independence from the kingdom of God. Adam became a creature. This is good. Write this down. Adam became a creature who did not know who he was. If you don't believe me, have you ever asked yourself, who am I? If we did not have the fall, if we were not born into sin, do you realize you would have come into this earth knowing your purpose, knowing who you are, no one would have been able to influence you. No one, even if you were born into a family who abused you or hurt you or talked bad about you, you would be so resolute in your mind why you're here. It takes us a little while because we live in this world and we have to overcome those things. Adam become a creature that did not know why he existed. Adam lost the truth about himself. Does anybody feel like that sometimes? I do. Do you know what God did though? He had a salvage plan, a salvation plan. If man messes up, it's all right because I have a way I'm going to restore him. God said, I'm gonna have a secret, some secret wisdom about them that I'm going to hide in me. Before the world began, he hid it. And this wisdom was destined for your glory. Anybody know, want to know what it is? I'm going to tell you, I can't tell you what it is, but I'm going to tell you how it can be revealed to you. <clears throat> Look at verse 7 again. We speak of God's secret wisdom, wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. This is the New Testament. That word glory is, anybody remember in the Greek? Doxa. It means full weight. It means heavy weight. It means nature. <clears throat> so, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory. The true weight, the glory of you, the true weight of you is hidden inside of God. Everybody got that? You've got to get that to get the rest of it. The true glory, the true weight of you is hidden inside of God. It's destined because it's the fully realized you. It's the completed you. That's why God sees you based on what he made you to be. No matter where you are right now. He sees you what he made you to be. I'm going to prove that in the next lesson because I think I'm going to, on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about a man in the Bible that is a good story about that. The real you is hidden inside of God. The real you. So if you have messed up, if you have failed, you don't need to hold that against yourself. You need to repent if you've messed up and move on. You need to do that. Not say, man, I've messed up and that's it. God's done with me. No. You messed up because... 
That's not really you. That was you in a moment of time. If it was the fully realized you, the doxa you, the glory of you, the full weight of you, the fully realized potential of you, then you wouldn't have messed up. My son falls. He gets hurt. He learns not to do that. Sometimes God allows us to get some spiritual knots on our head. Anybody have any spiritual knots? Anybody have any spiritual scars? <laughs> Sometimes we feel like we broke a leg or two, amen? <clears throat> Your future, if, if the fully realized you is inside of God, then no one else in this world can tell you who you really are. There's not a test that can tell you who you really are. Lord Jesus. Let's look at verse 9. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. That means that there is not a man on this earth that has heard what God is going to do for you and who you're supposed to be. There's not a man on this earth that their eye has seen the fully realized you and can tell you what you're supposed to be. There's no man on this earth who has ever had it even enter into their brain the fully realized you. It's in God. And only God knows it. Praise God. Verse 10. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. When I read this, I mean, it's amazing how you can read something so many times and then God can just show you something. I mean, I felt like right there, I mean, when I got on the floor, I felt like I was putting the Holy Ghost to work because I know that the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, he won't speak anything of himself, only what Jesus has told him. And so I'm saying, tell me, reveal to me, show me. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. <clears throat> Do you know what that lets me know? That God doesn't want the hidden secret about me to remain a secret to me. He doesn't want it to be hidden from me. He wants me to know. It couldn't have been passed down through the lineage of Adam because Adam messed up. And the spirit that lived inside of Adam left Adam. And Adam didn't even know who he was anymore. And man has spent all of this time trying to figure out, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? What's going on? God wanted to get his spirit back inside of us so that we could discover who it is that we are supposed to be. He didn't want to leave it to man, your parents, somebody in your family to pass it down to you. He protected it. He kept it a secret and he hid it inside of himself before the world began. I know. Man has a will. Man has, an author has authority. Man can decide to walk away from me. My son, who will be slain before the foundation of the earth, will be the way for redemption for them. And when they are reconciled to me, and I can come into them and sup again, I want to be able to tell them, I am your father, I created you, and this is what you are meant to do. 
God has revealed it to us by his spirit. <clears throat> so the key to the kingdom secret about you is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Ghost, you are busy being somebody that you're not. Because he leads you into all truth. How can you know who you truly are without his spirit? And if you were ever talking down about yourself, if you truly knew who you were, you wouldn't do it. Do you realize how we damage ourselves? Sometimes in life we go through so much put down, so many people telling us that we're nothing that eventually we just get into the habit of putting ourselves down. I can't tell you, when I started this, this Bible study that we used to have on Fridays, how many different people would come up to me and they would tell me, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really smart. And I'd have to stop them. I mean, we went through some correction period of, you can't say that about yourself. Because when you say that, you're saying, this thing that God created is not smart. Sometimes I'll do something and I'll say, man, I'll get so frustrated. And, I'll, and I've done this when I've been working on a car. I do usually do all of my own car work. And I'll get, sometimes... I'll be reading in that manual, just put this on this and turn. And I'm thinking, well, they didn't tell me I'm going to have to bend all like this. I mean, they don't show you that. They make it look real simple. And I'm sitting here, my back starts hurting, and then I can't do it. And I'll, I have, God forgive me, I, I've thrown my wrench three yards down the road. Not three yards, that wouldn't be far. Three people's yards down the road. And I'll say, I'm so stupid. And because I, I know this stuff now, God is quick to reveal the knowledge he's shown to me. And I'll say, I'm not stupid. And I know I probably look like a crazy person. I'm stupid. I'm not stupid. <laughs> and if Gary or Cheryl is out in the yard watching, they're thinking, I'm surprised they come to this church. <laughs> he's insane. <laughs> Does anybody ever argue inside their head? Me and Hope try to save water, and a lot of times we'll just we'll take a shower at the same time. And I, I'm sitting there. If I take a shower by myself, I usually get out of the shower aggravated because I've argued with myself. Is that hit home with anybody? No. We're weird. Oh, praise God. You got to be able to laugh at yourself. The Bible said we're peculiar people. I'm peculiar. <laughs> well, we're peculiar. We're different. Luke 2, 41 through 50. Look at this. Now his parents, talking about Jesus' parents. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. Verse 45, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. 
verse 49. And he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Do you know what I get from this? Even your parents don't know who you are. Jesus is like, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Because that is what's supposed to be normal. You being about the work that you were born to do. Don't you wish you were 12 year old and just starting? Oh, Jesus. Let's look back at, um, at verse 8 real quick. <clears throat> None, uh, uh, verse 8, yeah. No, no, no. Let me go down to um, verse 10. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Man, this is good. God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So his spirit is the one that reveals to us. The spirit searches all things. Even the deep things of God. Now, God by himself is just beyond understanding. His wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding is beyond comprehension. But this says that the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. To me, everything of God is deep, but this says that there are some things to God that are deep. Let's look at verse 11. For who among men knows the faults of a man except the man's spirit within him? Can I tell what it is that your motives are, your intent is. Not unless you show me some type of, I mean, if somebody breaks my window and comes in and they have a ski mask on, I, I have a clue of their intent. But if I seen that person the day before out in the street, unless God revealed it to me, I wouldn't know. Only you know what is inside of your mind and what you are thinking. That's what this says. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Only you know what you're thinking. Sometimes you might be talking to somebody and they get you to taste something and they'll say, isn't that the best thing you ever tasted? I made that. And you're going, hmm... If they knew what your spirit man was thinking, they might look at the recipe again. <laughs> There's some things that may go on in our minds sometimes and we are very thankful that only we know what we are thinking at that moment. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. That makes the spirit of God so important to me because I want to know what God's thinking. I want to know what's on his mind because if he holds in him what is destined for to be my glory that I give to him who I am, what I've been made to do, what I have been created to be. And if it is only inside of him, I, and I don't know what God's thinking. Only the spirit of God can know the thoughts of God. And his spirit can live inside of us and does live inside of us if you have the filling of the Holy Ghost. Do you realize why God designed it where his spirit is inside of you? Because 
Remember verse 10? The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. He puts His Spirit inside of you so that He can reveal to you who you are made to be because who you are is hidden inside of God. And the only one who can seek inside of the mind of God is the Spirit of God. Is that deep? He said... If I just tell them, they won't get it. Do you believe that? Anytime God ever revealed to somebody in the Old Testament of who they are, they were in a condition that they didn't look like who they were designed to be. And most of the time, they, God was trying to convince them of who they are, and they were trying to convince God of why they weren't. You are a deliverer of my people. You're going to deliver my people, Moses. I can't talk, talk, talk. God tells you stuff, who you are, and most of the time you're thinking, I can't do this. I'm going to give you all of this land. Two spies go out and they say, oh, we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. Look at the Old Testament. They would, God would tell them who they are. And it was hard for them to believe. I mean, look at Rahab, a prostitute. And she is told that she is going to be part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Do you know what people of our society would do if... Somebody married a prostitute and they knew that some great person was supposed to come. They'd say, oh, this cannot be. (laughs) But see, God knows who they are before they're made. It doesn't matter about the decisions they have made once they're here. He's got a plan to restore them from all the things that they've done that's messed up. Somebody say amen to that. Lord Jesus. Let's look at verse, uh, oh, did I get all of uh, 11? Let's look at Psalm uh, 139. This is good. If I say surely, hold on, let me go back. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Let's look what David says in Psalm 139, 11 through 18. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. These people who are saying well you know abortion is fine at this certain age because it's still a a, a certain it's a zygote it's not far along it doesn't have any formation God says when I when you were woven together in the depths of the earth and his eyes saw your unformed body that's a good scripture to write down and remember whenever you're talking to somebody about abortion and they try to give you some science behind why they have justified that it's okay. <clears throat> All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Isn't that amazing? All the days ordained for me. That means every day that God has ordained for you, God knows them before they even came to be. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. 
His thoughts are precious. How vast is the sum of them? Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. God loves you. Let's look back at 1 Corinthians. Let's look at verse 12. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Look at that. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? He tells us why. That we may understand what God has freely given us. His spirit lives inside of you. He ordained it to live inside of you, to be inside of you, so that you may understand what God has freely given you. That's why he'll tell you things. He'll show you big things. And you think, man, I can't do that. That's too big for me. And he has to be there to tell you because you won't do it on your own. You'll think of why you can't. What you lack. His spirit is for everybody. Amen. Joel chapter 2, 28 through 29. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Do you know why this is there? Because he don't want you to think that his spirit is designed for someone with a, in a certain status. Someone at a certain class. Aren't you glad that it ain't, he didn't say I'll pour out my spirit on the upper class and the middle class. (laughs) We might be left out. He said even for the servant, even for the lowliest person, He wants his spirit inside of them. Why? Because they have a purpose. How are they going to know their purpose unless his spirit is inside of them? Because what they are and who they are and what they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do is hidden inside of God. And only the spirit of God can search God to find what it is and to tell you. Matthew 16, 13. I think I'm... I'm going to have to get to a close on this. I didn't get to get through everything. <clears throat> when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Y'all remember him asking this? Does God know everything? Yes. Does any man in this world know or can tell you who you are? No. Who knows? God. It's been hidden in him. Amen. What has he done in order for you, for it to be revealed to you? His spirit living inside of you. Does his spirit search all things? Yep. What about the deep things of God? Yep. Just like a man, no no man can know another man's thoughts except for the man's spirit inside of him knows his thoughts the same. The spirit of God is the only one that can reveal the deep things of God. And he lives inside of you. So here's Jesus. I tell you, the more I read this word every year when I go through God's word he gives something so wonderful and I'm just amazed he asked his disciples who do people say the son of man is he's asking them Jesus knows they they don't know why they can't who do people say the Son of Man is? And they begin to say, you're a great, they say you're a great prophet. They say that you're John the Baptist that's been risen. They say that you're uh, uh, Elijah that's come back. 
They name all these things. Then look what he says in verse 15. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? They were afraid. But Peter came out and he said, you are God's Messiah. Jesus gets excited. Do you know why? Because he knew that he, he knew that Peter really didn't know. Even when Peter was saying it, he knew Peter really didn't know. Look what he says. Uh, verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. So Peter stands up and says, you're God's Messiah. Jesus, t- <laughs> Jesus takes away any glory right there that he, could, that he might be able to have by saying, I know, I know, by telling him you really don't know. That's really what he was saying because you would not be able to know except my Father in heaven. That's why he was so excited. He was telling him you should be so happy because this did not enter your brain by your own intellect. Peter, this did not enter your brain because you are so smart. No man revealed this to you. You only know this because it came from my Father in heaven. That gives me chills. Is Jesus not smart? Oh my goodness. Let me read the rest of this right here. He tells him, he says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. Expressing spiritual truth, truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. That's why you have such a hard time with some people, trying to show them something, because they don't have God's Spirit in them. I profess to know nothing. I've, I've... I teach things and I'll have people come up sometimes and tell me that was so deep. And they may think, they may be confused and think that I'm smart. I'm not smart. I just have an assignment. And it is his spirit that lives inside of me that reveals things. I know nothing. Do y'all realize that? That I know nothing. Everybody point at me right now. Point and say, you know nothing. (laughs) Only what God has revealed to you. The more I tell God that I know nothing, only what he reveals to me. Do you know what he does? He reveals more. I love it. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself, oh my God, God, this is good. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Do you know how huge this is? The spiritual man makes judgments about all things. But he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. Once you have the spirit of God inside of you, it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you. It doesn't matter what they call you. It don't matter how smart they say. If they think you're dumb or if they think you're smart, none of that can be a judge of who you are. You're not subject to any man who calls you stupid. You're not subject to anybody that puts you down because the spirit of God lives inside of you. And the Bible says 
You are not subject to their judgment. Is that not wonderful? The spiritual man is not, I just feel like I got to say that. The spiritual man is not subject to any man's judgment. That makes, that is such a blessing to, to have God's spirit inside of me. Him revealing who I am, what I'm supposed to be. And I'm just listening. Lord, what do you want me to do? Tell me. I mess up. He'll tell me. I say, God, I'm sorry. And I'll keep going. I'll, I might make a wrong path. He'll say, you need to go right. Yes, Lord. I'm just doing what he says. I'm listening to what he says that I am. And do you know what? That makes me completely protected because nobody can tell me who I am nobody can tell you you have the spirit of God inside of you nobody can tell you who you are or who you are not you're not subject to any man's judgment Woo! that feels good somebody says something bad about you you need to be able to look back and be so assured. See, you've got to have that relationship with him. You've got to stir that gift of God that's inside of you and begin to listen to him instead of all this yak, yak, yak of people that you may be around that talk bad about you, that put you down. It don't matter. If they say something bad to you, just smile and say, man, if you really knew who I was. God's told me who I am, so it doesn't matter what you say. What you say is not who I'm going to be. It takes such a load off, doesn't it? Now, let me tell you this. That includes yourself. Sometimes we are the worst person to put ourselves down. When we do... I don't know if I'll say we. Some of you may have never been into alcohol or into drugs. When you hurt yourself, when you damage your body, when you drink alcohol and get drunk and you are destroying yourself, when you do drugs, you talk bad about yourself, you say that you're nothing. Do you know what that is? That is evidence it is proof of the ignorance that you have of who you are. Because if you really knew who you were, you wouldn't do it. Just like they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory if they knew who he was. Anytime, anytime you say something bad about yourself or you put yourself down, you've got to correct that and realize, man, if I knew who I was, this stupid brain inside of here would not say those things about itself. See, God will tell you something. Your brain only knows how to comprehend what it has seen, what it has done, what other people have called you. And so a lot of times it gets just wired to say negative things and to be pessimistic about everything. That's why when he come, he said, you've got to transform your mind. God tells you something. It don't matter if you don't know how you're going to do it. You just need to say, all right, part of me doesn't know how to accept this. But I know the spirit of God would not tell me a lie. That helps, that helps me to realize, hey, I've got to line up with what he says. Amen. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Thank God. Y'all stand with me. I went over just a little bit longer than I usually did, but I really left out a lot because I got a lot of stuff I wanted to, to give you in here, but I'll try to compile some of it into Wednesday. Anybody learn anything? Praise God. We want to thank you on the internet for watching us. If you don't know the Lord and you want his spirit inside of you, there's something that you have to do first. You have to be reconciled to God. 
No matter where you are, I don't care how 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 bad you think you have been. I don't care if you think, man, there's not enough grace to save me. I don't care if you're a mobster watching this. No matter how bad you have been, no matter how wicked you have been, grace has always abounded far beyond anything that you could have ever done. It's whosoever will. And I want to tell you right now that he wants you to return to him. You just have to pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, Forgive me for my sin. I have been a sinner. I accept the work on the cross of Calvary, the shedding of your blood for the remission of my sins. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me and to come into my heart. I confess you are the Lord Jesus. Come into me and change me. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that, I pray that you would let us know. Go to lmcigreenville.org, click contact up at the top, and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Now that you have been saved, his spirit is a gift for you. All you have to do is accept him as the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost is given to them who obey him. I pray right now that you would just ask him, say I can't promise that I'll be perfect, but I'll do my best. Give me the spirit of God. Let it live inside of me and change me day by day. No matter if people try to tell you that you got to be everything right now, no. It's a day by day thing. I've got a long ways to go myself and I've been in it for a while. Let him change you and let him start today. Thank you.